What's going on, everybody? Back in better than ever for another week of St. Pius 10 football with the man, the myth, the legend over there, Greg Cranfield. Coach, uh, I know coming off of this last week, a 28-7 to loss to Antonio Prepa, really, I mean, five minutes left to go in the game. It's 14-7, to really close there at the end, and then just that last little bump there by Antonio Prep to, to eventually win the game. Uh, talk about that. Talk about, I guess, just being so close throughout the whole game and, and then how it kind of finished. Yeah, I think the whole idea or the whole concept of the game was was just who's going to make more mistakes because both of us were were able to control the ball, um, but you know one of our score the, our scoring drive was, I think was 15 or 16 plays long. Um, it's just the fact that you had to earn everything that you were going to get um, on Friday for both teams. Like I thought our defense played well. Um, I thought Antonian converted third downs. Uh, which which was huge, and and we converted third downs. It's just when we got down to it, um, we had penalties in the wrong positions during the game, uh, which cost us yardage on, on on key drives, and then we also turned the ball over three times, and they didn't turn the ball over, which to me was was probably the biggest part of the game. Um, I think we got outplayed special teams. Um, there's there's no doubt, and I put that responsibility back on on myself. Uh, to get my team and, and our team better prepared for those situations. Um, also, I, I look at video, and I, you know, when it comes to um, the plan that we have in place, I don't think there's anything wrong with the plan in place. We've just get, got to get the right guys in the right, in the right spots, so that way we can execute the plan that we have in place. Uh, there's no magic recipe, you know, for – for winning football games, I promise you. If it were, everybody would be paid millions of dollars to get it. Uh, it, it comes down to hard work and execution. And on Friday night, Antonian Prep did that uh, late in the fourth quarter, and and we got we got beat. We talk about some of your players of the week. The Raising Canes Caniac Offensive Player of the Week, Vincent Dusha. Nice game for him. Twelve catches for 140 yards, and I, I feel like we've seen his name before. Has he kind of just emerged throughout this season and become a bigger and bigger weapon for this offensive unit? Absolutely. And I, I mean, here's a guy that at the first of the year we had, we had, you know, big hopes as being our number two wide receiver or possibly our number three wide receiver. Um, and with, with Logan going down early in the year, Vincent kind of had to elevate his game. And then we lost a corner. Well, we actually lost both of our corners early in the season. Um, and, and do Vincent had to step up there as well. So you're talking about a kid that we, we wanted to have an important role now who has a ginormous role starting for us both offensively and defensively. And he's, he's playing his tail off, you know. Um, obviously, he'll be the first to tell you that, that there are things that he needs to get better at in order for this team to be, uh, uh, you know, at the next level. Um, but he's working every day and trying to do those things. Uh, I kept him yesterday after video, after practice, and we pr probably watched 30, 30, 30, 45 more minutes of video um, just evaluating his game so that he could find things that he needs to improve on. So re really impressed with the job that he's done this year and looking for even bigger and better things for his future. And, and I know it's got to get you excited that, you know, when you do get a Logan Tanner back here hopefully in, in a couple of weeks, then – you have another weapon where teams can't just key on Logan and say, Hey, we really need to cover this guy. Well, when Vincent's on the other side, correct. And now you kind of have another weapon to, to spread that defense out. How much does that help you when you do have these extra pieces that are elevating their game to where defensive units have to kind of respect their game a little bit? Uh, absolutely. And I, and I think that's an important part. Um, you know, we believe that everything happens for a reason. And ideally, what we're looking for is, is, is to try to make a push once we get to the playoffs. And we're hoping that everything that has happened, this is very a glass half full theory that we have right here, but we're hoping that everything that, that has happened to us in the past is preparing us for a, a bright future. Uh, one of those things exactly, putting Vincent and Jackson Mobley and guys like that in situations right now uh, throughout this course of or, or this this part of our, our, our season, uh, hopefully when we get a couple more of those pieces back, you know, another one that, that, that we're missing is Nathaniel Lolo, who is a, a, a huge piece of, of what we do. 
Uh, once we get those guys back and ready to play, we hope that the elevation of those other guys' game even make us a, a, a more explosive on offense. And, and, and right now, uh, I, I mean, it's not rocket science. We're struggling offensively. Our defense is playing uh, pretty well. You know, we gave up less than 200 yards, you know, of total offense uh, a couple of times this year and have ended up not winning the football game. You know, um, it's a situation in which um, I wrote on the board on, on Monday morning, we have got to learn to finish. Uh, and that's both offensively and defensively. Uh, but, you know, the kids in that locker room, they're fighting their tails off. All, our offensive line is playing as, as good as, as I've, I've had in a long, long time. And those, those kids are, are coming to work every day and, and, and just fighting. And, and we appreciate it. Defensive line, secondary, all, all of it. You know, there's not one kid in that locker room that, that I feel like is, is, is licking wounds and feeling sorry for themselves. They're all wanting to do what's necessary, and that, that's exciting for me and helps me come to work every day with a smile on my face, knowing that we've got good kids and knowing that we've got hardworking kids that were raised the right way, and, and, and that's important for us. You talk about the defensive unit and, and Carson Hens. Once again, he's a, we got co-defensive players of the week this week for the first time this, this season. Uh, Carson Hens, four solo tackles, six assists, two sacks, two tackles for loss. Then Burke Battenfield, we've seen his name before this season. Right. Three solo, six assists, one pass deflection. Uh, you know, let's start with let's start with Burke because we talk a lot about Carson. Is Burke another one of those guys like a Vincent who has just continued to elevate his game throughout the season, has gotten better week after week, and now we're seeing the fruits of that labor? Right. And, and Burke, Burke's – Always been an outstanding athlete. I mean, let's go back to last season when he was, you know, he and Carson were, were top two tacklers until Burke suffered a season-ending injury last year. Um, then fast-forwarding to this year, Burke was one of those guys preseason that we had a lot of conversations on on what to do with Burke. Do we put Burke at, at tailback? Do we put Burke at safety? Do we put Burke at outside linebacker? And it's just because he's such a versatile and, and, and electrifying athlete that he can do so many different things. Um, Burke ha has elevated his game as well uh, his senior year, and, and that's, that's a great thing. Well, you know, we talk about it uh, during the preseason that every senior should say when they graduate and they're gone that their senior season was their best season, that they played the best football that they could their senior season. And I think Burke is going to have no problem telling his, his, his children and his grandchildren one day that, that he prepared himself to have an outstanding senior year. And, and he's still got more to go. Um, I'll give you a great story about Burke just the other day, or just yesterday. Um, you know, our, our kickoff coverage um, is, is struggling. And, and Burke was one of the guys as a junior that led our special teams in tackling. And he came up to me and he goes, Coach, I know I'm starting on offense right now. I know I'm starting on defense right now. But if you want me to be on that kickoff coverage team, put my name down. And I'm like, brother, you got it. And, and, and it's that type of kid that St. Pius is full of that are all willing to do whatever they need to do to help, help this team and help this school. And, and I'm proud of, of, of what Burke has, has become and, and excited about what he can do in the future. And, you know, we talk about Burke and we talk about Carson Hentz. We talk about Carson Hentz all season long. I remember seeing Carson last season, and, and, and there's part of me where it's like, man, like, you know, the college colleges need to be looking at this dude. Like, he, sure. he produces consistently. And, and, and I think sometimes, like, you know, and I don't know all his measurables, like height and weight and all these things, but sometimes I think colleges get caught up on, well, is this guy – is this guy five foot nine or is he six foot or is he like – but for me, and you can agree or disagree, for me, what I see when I watch Carson Hens play, it doesn't matter how tall he is or how big he is, that guy is going to put his helmet down, and he's going to go downhill, and he's going to knock somebody down because of his heart inside his chest and how much he's going to play. I would assume you agree with that statement. No, it's, I mean, it's 10 million percent. Uh, Carson's another guy, you know, um, preseason, we had Matt Gedeke, who was our short snapper, who, who suffered an injury. Then Logan Tanner goes to short snapper, who again suffered an injury. So we're to our third string short snapper, and we really didn't have one at that point. You know, it was about, we were talking about bringing up a JV guy, 
And lo and behold, who walks up to me? Carson Hintz walks up and he says, Coach, I'll do it, man. You know, I'll start working, you know, whatever I need to do. So we put him into that role. And in the middle of last week, we had a, a, another kid that suffered an injury on the offensive side. And Carson told me, he said, Coach, I know, I, don't, I know nothing about that position, but you know I'll fight if you put me in there. And, and I thought to myself, man, that, that's, that's, the, that's the type of people that we need around us, you know. And that's why these guys were elected captain because of the fact that, that, that it's always team first and then, and then me second. And, and Carson's another prime example. Um, I think there's no doubt that after this season, people are going to see the body of work that Carson's put together through film, and, and there will be some collegiate bites. Uh, if not, then I may be the dumbest, dumbest coach in the whole wide world because I don't see what I, – I see everything that they need to see. And if it's all about intangibles, I tell every college recruiter the same thing. No touchdown has ever been made by going up, so it matters not how tall you are. And when it comes to defense, it's all about putting people down on the ground. And Carson Hintz knows how to do that. So, um, like I said, big things are going to happen to him just because of the way that he works and, 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 and how, how strong a heart he has for his teammates. And then your other two players of the week, special teams player of the week, Tanner Hansen, and then scout team player of the week, Ethan White. Talk about those two uh, players and, and why they got the nod this week. Yeah, uh, like I said, there weren't a lot of special teams highlights for us this week, in my opinion. I, I know I'm very critical on that, but, but we take pride in doing things well uh, in all three phases of the game. And, and, and it's sad that a couple of missed tackles make you feel bad about the unit, but it's the reality of what, of what we do as coaches. Um, but Tanner did, did a great job this week preparing, uh, went out there, and, uh, made his extra point, and then – and then did some good things to the special teams. Ethan White is a kid that plays uh, in the secondary for us on the JV and is always ready to run out there and give us a great look. And he's a hardworking kid. I do believe he's got uh, the potential to be, to be great for us. And the work that he's doing this year um, is, is laying that foundation so that next year he can step in and have a, 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 an important role with us. Talking right now with Greg Cranfield, head coach of those St. Pius X Panthers. Uh, I know this week take on Central Catholic in district play, then next week at St. Thomas, and then you get San Antonio Christian. Those are the final three games of the district season for your squad. And I know getting guys back is going to be key and stuff like that. Do you – I know coaches, and I know you'll probably say this, it's one game at a time. You take it one wow. game at a time and stuff like that. But do you start – kind of forecasting and looking like, okay, if we do this, this, and this, we can be here if, if this doesn't go our way. And I know we talked about this earlier in the season with standings and stuff, but with only three district games left, do you really start evaluating those teams and kind of seeing what's coming down the pipe? I think it's just a matter of being prepared for any situation. And I think in order to do that, yes, there is some forecasting that you have to look, look down the road and see what's, what's coming up. Um, but also, I think that there's a huge part in, in, in what you're saying, there's some validity in what you're saying about uh, just the next, the next step in the process. Um, so I think it's a balance of both, understanding where you want to go, how to get there long term, what's the big picture, and then more specifically, what you have to do today to prepare yourself for that, for that next step. Um, and we've told, told each other this since we started, things, things change every single day. And, and I think there's no doubt that uh, you, you've got to prepare yourself for it. I look at it much like a golf, uh, playing golf. Uh, when you step up on the tee, ideally your focus is on the end, but you've got to, you've got to concentrate everything you've got on that next shot uh, because birdie is what you're after. But if the first shot you take, you spray into the woods, then, then you refocus and go, you know what, par is not a bad score right here. So take out all the, 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 the two uh, dangerous of, uh, of decisions that you have, understanding that par is a good, is a good score, you know, and, and, and that's kind of what we do on a daily basis, you know, when it comes to how sudden things change and how quickly you have a game plan set and all of a sudden somebody's gone off of that game plan because of, of injuries or because of whatever it may be. And then you've got to have a plan for everything. Um, if you spend all your time, we, we talk to our kids a lot 
about the balance of life, looking at things through a telescope and through a microscope. Uh, we will often tell the kids that they look at their lives through a microscope, what they see about three or four inches in front of their face, and they will constantly forget big picture, where am I trying to go? Um, and it's decisions that under that microscope you can make that affect your whole life if you don't know what your, your, your big plan is. I think as coaches, we have to have that balance uh, uh, the same way. We have to know big picture what we want to accomplish and then microscopically, how are we going to accomplish that, that ultimate goal? Um, you know, on the reverse, guys that constantly are looking through that telescope at, at what do I want? I want to win football. I want to win Friday. I want to win Friday, but never take the time to, to, to focus their attention on the process that it takes to get there. Um, they'll, they'll both end up um, on, on the bad side of, of the win-loss column. Um, so you have to be able to balance it. And I think as coaches, we do that constantly you know big picture here's what we'd like to do microscopically this is what we have to do today this is what we have to do this minute in order to prepare ourselves to to get to that end in product so it's always taking those baby steps along the way and, and yep. trusting the process because i mean you can look at uh, a perfect example would be texas a and m you know they they lose to mississippi state the sky is falling you know, what's wrong with the Aggies? And then they come out and they trust the process. They take care of their business. And then they upset number one Alabama uh, this past weekend and shock the world. And, uh, you know, because it's one of those things like, oh, no one can beat Alabama. You know, right. Nick Saban can never lose to an assistant. Well, A&M went out there and, you know, they played better than Alabama. And do, do you sometimes, like, do you take instances like that and show your team, like, things like that? Like, hey, guys, the – they lost to Mississippi State unranked. They went unranked into Alabama. Everybody was picking against them. Like, you know, sometimes it, you, you may feel like, like, hey, everyone's picking against us this week because of the records and this and that. But do you use instances like that to kind of show them, like, hey, if you do everything right, you can win? <laughs> yep. So number two on my things to talk about this, this Monday for Monday morning meetings was the Alabama A&M game. And we talked about in those situations that – in the world's view, Alabama was the better football team. But in the course of that game, A&M made fewer mistakes than Alabama did. And when it came down to it, we, all, we also talked about the two problems that we felt like we were having, and that's finishing drives and then special teams. And you go back to the A&M-Alabama game, A&M intercepts the ball from the one-yard line as Alabama's going in, and then – when Alabama does score, they kick off, and A&M runs the kickoff back. So how similar football games are, and, and, you know, and the lessons that you can learn from each of them. But I would say absolutely, knowing that, that when it comes down to, it's all about executing and not, not at the end of the game, but executing one play at a time to try to step up and make that, that next big play. Uh, we also talked about guys that have to be able to – to, to make explosive plays and to limit explosive plays from the defensive side. And I felt like, you know, for the most part, uh, A&M did that, you know, and, and, and they outplayed Alabama. There's no doubt they outplayed them. Yeah, and for people at home, uh, I don't sit through Coach Cranfield's Monday morning meetings. And, no, and not get, at all. Get this list. But somehow we always hit on like one or two of the topics of the week. It's yeah, just, man. It's that telepathic connection. It, ha yeah. it just has to be. I think it comes down to, A, you understanding sports the way that you do. B, you understanding high school kids the way that you do because you're around them all the time and following them. And then C, I think just understanding, regardless of what profession we have in life, uh, the, the lessons that we learn through sports, and that's what we try to teach these kids all the time, the lessons that we learn through athletics and sports and football, that, that there are ups and downs, there, there, there are ebbs and flows. The, the world is not full of sunshine and rainbows. Sometimes it rains and sometimes it storms. But the, the people with plans and, and the people with courage and integrity that can handle those situations will always see that there is tomorrow, that there, that, that there is a next day. And what do I have to do to prepare and get my family moving forward in that right direction? And, and that's why, I mean, that's why family is such a big deal uh, to us, um, because I want people to, to understand that they're never alone, 
that in that locker room, that on that field, that there's always a band of brothers that are working with them and, and, and a community that's behind them and supporting them because ultimately they want kids that, that go out and, and fight their guts out. And the wins and losses, they take care of themselves. Winning is a byproduct of doing things the right way. And if we do things right, then we'll take care of that winning column will take care of itself. So that's what we're trying to do. Ultimate goal, do things the right way, you know. And, and, and I think our kids, our kids fight every day to try to do just that. And it's a big reason why down the road a lot of kids, you know, these kids that become men that become go to college football and even into the NFL, the coaches that they talk about are their high school coaches. Even yep. Kobe Bryant talked about his high school coach. Michael Jordan talked about his high school coach. Yep. Um, it's always the high school coach that they talk about because of the life lessons that they're taught inside that locker room on that field come that, that eventually help them in later in life. So that's what we'll end this week's show on good life lessons. It's a roller coaster. It's not always sunshine, but there's sunshine always at the end of the tunnel. You just got to right. get through the rainstorm. Just have to have your windshield wipers on. That's full on blast. Sometimes. <laughs> full blast. Full blast. Sometimes the windshield wipers go flying off. and You're just like, I just got to drive. And eventually the rain will stop raining. So my sister, is, my sister Katie sent me something and, and, and it's not brand new, but it's, it's, it means so much because she sent it to me and it's talking about, uh, talking about a, a situation where it's always raining and some people complain about the rain. Some people learn to dance in the rain. And, and, and I think that's so important that, that it's, it's a matter of perspective when something does go bad, how are you going to handle it? And I think those life lessons that we talked about through our, through our parents, through our families, through, our, through, in my case, my two sisters, my wife, my son, those, those lessons that they helped me learn, that's what gets us through. And, and that's the important part of it. Exactly. And that's what we will end this week's show on. Coach Cranfield, we wish you the best of luck again this week. We'll be back every single Wednesday at noon. You can catch St. Pius 10th football with Coach Greg Cranfield on our Vite Media Network. And don't forget, not this Friday, but next Friday, September 22nd, I believe, St. Thomas comes to town. And you know who's also coming to town? Vibe countdown to kickoff. We will be on site. St. Pius X students, we need you there. Signs, noisemakers, cheerleaders, need the whole thing. We need college game day-esque atmosphere. We will be yeah. on campus, St. Pius X. I might even swing by Coach Cranfield's office before, before and see what's going on. Remind, remind yourself not to wear orange or you'll just you'll you'll disappear in here. So <laughs> that's true. That's true. We'll see everybody next week. And if don't remember, don't forget next Friday night, the 22nd, we will be on campus at St. Pius 10th countdown to kickoff. See everybody next week. Go Panthers.